Ladies and gentlemen, the commander, United States Pacific Command, Admiral Harry B. Harris, Jr. Tell you what, Marine introductions are the best introductions, so thank you very much for that. So let me add my acknowledgments to Governor and Mrs. Ige, Senator Hirono, General Bramlett, Admiral and Mrs. Mackey, Admiral Zadipur, Admiral and Mrs. Swift, General and Mrs. Brown, General and Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, Generals Pond and Stackpole, uh, members of the Consular and Diplomatic Corps, fellow flag and general officers, senior enlisted leaders, and distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. A special shout out to Helen Tulin, Jocko's own, very own Yellow Rose of Texas. Your unwavering support, your unwavering support and dedication throughout your husband's amazing career have allowed John to do what he loves, to lead Marines across four decades. Your love of the Corps is clear as well. You're a founding member of the Semper Fi Fund, which continues to provide immediate financial assistance to our wounded servicemen and women and their families. So please, ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. And to Donna Berger, welcome to our PACOM Ohana, and thank you for your support of Dave throughout his distinguished career as he takes on this awesome new responsibility of leading our Pacific Marines. Folks, as I look around the size of this audience, it's clear that John Tulin has many friends and well wishers. So I'll try not to confuse As wonderful as it is to celebrate with family and friends, it's important to remind everyone here while we conduct this change of command ceremony. It's not for the guests, and it's not for the families, and it's certainly not for me. No, this ceremony is for the troops. It's for our Pacific Marines. Today is the day that we bid fair winds and following seas to one of the great leaders in the Marine Corps, a legendary leader of Marines, a legendary uh, combat leader. At the same time, we welcome another tremendous leader to the Crucible of Component Command. This is a Marine Corps day, make no mistake about it. For even though we now live in a world where we must think, learn, and fight jointly, and rightfully so, today we go back to our roots and take special note of what lies at the very heart of the Marine Corps, leading Marines in combat. Today's ceremony is one of our most cherished and important traditions. It represents the continuing recognition, indeed celebration, of who we are and what we value as military leaders, the absolute nature of accountability and the art of leadership. So this ceremony is for you, the men and women, the Marines and sailors of Mark Four Pack, to witness the passing of command responsibility from one officer to another. These ceremonies connect our histories in an unbroken chain. From 1775, when the Second Continental Congress decreed that two battalions of Marines be raised in support of our nation's revolutionary birth, to the defeat of the Barbier Pirates, to Veracruz, Bella Wood, Iwo Jima, Chosen, Way City, Fallujah, Helmut Province, an unbroken chain of valor and service. In fact, Chester Puller himself once commented on, on what separated the old breed from the new breed. He said that there's no difference as long as it's the Marine breed. So what did this crusty five-time Navy Cross recipient mean when he said Marine breed? I think he meant the Marines exude toughness. They never quit. They are semper fidelis, always faithful. These traits have existed in the Marine breed at every moment in the core of celebrated history, making the distinction between old and new meaningless. And that's why our devil dogs are legendary throughout the world. John and Dave are the Marine breed and more. They are officers of character whose backgrounds and achievements are simply incredible. A glance at General Tulin's bio is a retelling of some of our nation's fiercest battles. Time and again, he answered the call to lead in combat zones. He was in Iraq in Desert Storm with the 2nd Light Armored Infantry Battalion. During a tour at NATO headquarters, John focused his talents on Operation Allied Force in Bosnia and Kosovo. 
He returned to the sound of the guns at the start of Iraqi freedom to lead his regiment's combat crossing of the Diyala River as our forces converged in, on Baghdad in 2003. He led Marines in the first Battle of Fallujah in 2004, and in Afghanistan, he led our forces in the Helmand Province in 2011. John Tulin is a warrior through and through, the Marine breed for sure. And from what I've heard, he's become one of the most famous tribal dancers in all of Afghanistan. <laughs> Not to mention his famous rendition of Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. I've got to see that before I leave today. Folks, I've watched John and his Marines closely during my time in command, and one thing is crystal clear. I'm glad the Marines are on our side. These fine men and women represent the very best of our country. They're a powerful reminder of the values that kept America strong through the ages and will keep us strong well into the future. I'm proud to serve with you. Those of you standing behind me wearing the Globe, Eagle, and Anchor know that it's a badge of honor. The iconic Marine slogans that we've all heard are austere, non-apologetic representations of what one can look forward to when he or she joins the Corps. We don't promise you a rose garden. We don't accept applications, only commitments, earned, never given. I could stand here all day and name the defining personalities of the Marine Corps Lore that exemplify these slogans, names that you already know. Instead, I'll cut to the chase. All of the stories have one thing in common, leadership, under pressure, in combat. Marine Corps presence around the world not only keeps America safe, but also maintains peace and stability in an uncertain world. This is because we have selfless leaders like Generals Dunford, Tulin, and Berger, and Sergeant Major Paul McKenna. Marines are always all in. John, you led your Marines and sailors well and provided them with a vision that, time and again, brought success to Mar 4 PAC, the largest operational command in the Marine Corps. You worked hard to implement our nation's strategic rebalance to the Pacific. It wasn't going to happen just by coming to work every day and simply checking off boxes on a list. No, you looked at the bigger picture and matched the fiscal realities of today to the challenges, the challenges that we'll see tomorrow. You created, strengthened, and preserved relationships with nations throughout our theater, literally from Hollywood to Bollywood. For example, down under in Australia, you directed a Marine Rotational Force Darwin to conduct more inclusive and realistic training. Australia is a critical ally that I depend upon in peace and crisis. Your success led to the signing of the Forces Posture Agreement that broadened and deepened the U.S.-Australia Alliance's commitment to security in the Indo-Asia Pacific. As a coordinating authority for our efforts in the Philippines, your fingerprints there are everywhere, from the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement to our important bilateral exercise, Blinket Time. You defined what effective command and control looks like and ensured our ability to fight tonight. Another tangible example of the strategic scope of your vision and handiwork is evident in the PACOM Amphibious Leaders Symposium, or PALS. The second iteration of this event wrapped up in July. Amphibious forces from 20 nations got together to discuss how they could improve their craft, projecting power from the sea. The results, more collaboration and deeper partnerships throughout the region that strengthen our security network of amphibious forces. This is amphibiosity. You work with Admiral Swift in the Pacific Fleet to make the Navy and Marine Corps team tighter and strengthen our joint ability to project power from the sea. Amphibiosity is now a critical component of our nation's strategic rebalance to the Indonesian Pacific. And one of John's more obscure accomplishments, ladies and gentlemen, is that he was a Marine Corps professor at UPenn back in the 80s, where he taught then midshipman Mark Montgomery, where Admiral Montgomery is now my outstanding J3 in charge of all of PACOM operations. Now come to think of it, John, there might be a few people here who now want to blame you for Monty's successes, so maybe I should have left out that part. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt about General Tulin's impact on this region and on the Marine Corps. I've been told by some really smart people that giants no longer walk the earth. They may be right, but as you can see, John Tulin has left some huge footprints. As General Berger steps up to follow you, I know that he's more than capable of blazing his own independent, impactful trail. Coming to us from Command One Mef, Dave is also a combat-tested leader. 
In more than three decades of service, he's led Marines from the front in every climb and place and at all levels. From Operation Desert Storm to Operation Secure Tomorrow in Haiti to Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. He knows that hard work is its own reward and has what it takes to do this job. And he understands well the opportunities and dangers resident in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And although he won't admit it, as an infantry officer, he'll know, he knows that no matter which way you have to march, it's always uphill. Now, I realize that I've talked far longer than all of you wanted. As a student of history, I'm keenly aware that perhaps the greatest speech ever given was President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and it lasted only two minutes. And one of the longest ever delivered was Socrates, who was poisoned by his listeners. So before Sergeant Major McKenna gets any ideas, I'll wrap up my remarks by simply saying thanks. Jocko, thanks for the leadership you provided to our Pacific Marines and for your counsel on the tough issues that we've tackled together. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you for the four decades of your life devoted to the Corps in defense of our nation. Forty years, that's a long time. Coincidentally, it's just a bit more time than the grand old man of the Marine Corps, Archibald Henderson himself, spent as a commandant. It's also great to know that in those four decades, you didn't lose your Brooklyn accent, which I'm sure this audience will hear soon when you give your remarks. Dave, thanks for accepting the awesome responsibility of leading our Marines in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We're happy to have you and Donna join the PACOM Ohana. And last, but certainly not least, to the men and women of mar 4 Pack and all of the Marines serving in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Thanks for everything you do to defend our homeland and advance our national interests. What you do on a daily basis matters. It matters to the U.S. Pacific Command. It matters to our allies and partners around the region. And it matters to our nation. May God bless all of the Marines across the globe who boldly go in the harm's way. May God bless the Tulin and Berger families. May God bless this gorgeous, this beautiful, this wonderful state of Hawaii. And may God continue to bless the beacon of freedom that we call America. Thank you very much. Yeah.